shit you off. Not to. Sorry for the confusion of our end. Oh, don't worry about it.
talk in this normal voice. Okay, that's good. Um, well, thank you very much. Is Calvin here? Oh, Calvin, I, uh, he's at a conference, so he couldn't be here. I really appreciate the invitation. It's been just a pleasure to come over. You guys are so close. I, you think about Clemson being far away, but it's not. It's like an hour and 20 minutes from Athens. So um, it's been a pleasure, and, and I enjoyed talking with folks, and I, and I hope you get back over and come visit us in Athens. Um, yeah, so happy Halloween. Nobody's in costume. What the heck? <laughs> um, I, I was prepared to, to not be shocked. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell a story about uh, some research that we've been doing over a number of years. And it's a little bit of a scary tale to me because I think I'm just starting to figure out something about how that system might be working, and, I, and I'm still not sure we've got it right. Um, so let me share that with you. And it, and, it, and it revolves around stream flow. A lot of the work that I've done with USGS over the, the bunch of years now has involved changing stream flow and managing stream flows and how that might affect fishes and other critters that fish and wildlife in the state may care about. Um, this is a recently published report from the USGS. Jacob LaFontaine is over in Atlanta with that group where they've been trying to project how our stream flow is going to change across the southeast. And so you can see here, they were just modeling, they call this this Gulf Coast Plain region, and they're hoping to extend it. And he's showing, using a bunch of, what I say, 45 combinations of GCMs and emission scenario combination. So it's a big ensemble kind of projection. I wouldn't take this too seriously, nor do they. But it's showing for four seasons of the year projected changes in stream flow where the red colors are big losses compared to, to historic. And then the light and the blue are big gains. And, and when I look at this, I look at first just the heterogeneity across the landscape. Um, things really looking like they're going to dry out a bunch over in the west and kind of where I am, maybe not so much. And then around Atlanta and the big urban areas, actually more runoff as we infiltrate less water and put more pavement onto the landscape, that kind of thing. I think this is cool. So we're starting to have these kinds of projections, but, you, you know, they're, they're, they're what they are. Um, they're models. And even without... And we do live in a wet part of the world, but even without these, a projected change in, say, runoff and precipitation in a particular area, one thing we do know is that our population is growing and we're using more water um, for a variety of reasons. And so managers and folks concerned with conservation have been asking for a long time, what are the effects of changing stream flows on, uh, on biotic integrity, on species of concern? Um, on ecological functions in those streams. And, and these are just some examples of some of the species that we've worked with that are of conservation concern. And they're all dependent, they're, they only live in streams and rivers. They're dependent on stream flow. We're looking here at a little mad tom catfish that's been petitioned for listing un, under the Federal Endangered Species Act. Lives in the, um, well, it's a taxonomic mess. I won't say where it lives. Uh, the amber darter, um, 
is listed as endangered. It's up in the upper Coosa River system. Um, the Chattahoochee bass, which is an endemic bass to the Chattahoochee River system, entirely riverine. Tri-spot darter is up in the, uh, also upper Coosa, Re just listed as threatened in the last month or so, and the blue shiner, also up in that part of the world. These are the ones I had good pictures of. Of course, there are many, many. And so we're asking, as we look to the future and we think about changing stream flows, can we make predictions about um, how that may affect populations of these animals we care about? And it's not a new concern. Um, fisheries biologists particularly have been uh, worrying about flows downstream from dams, for instance, flows where we divert water. I had a nice talk with um, Luke just a little bit ago thinking about the state of South Carolina trying to develop in stream flow requirements. And so we, we've been wrestling with these problems for literally for decades. And a lot of that work, and there are hundreds of methods for trying to go downstream of a dam, say, in a river, measure things about that stream, its dimensions, and estimate how much water do we need to leave in here for the resident fishes. A lot of that is habitat based. This is a early paper, 1988. Paul Leonard and Don Orth up at Virginia Tech put this together. And those curves are for individual species of fish that use different kinds of habitats. Here they split them into four types. And it's just projecting how this habitat availability for these different species changes as you change stream discharge. So it's not new. Um, but I would say in the last 15 or 20 years, ecologists have really started to emphasize that it's not that one flow. We can't protect things with a minimum flow. That in fact, if you look uh, at a particular gauge, and I apologize, I'm coming off a cold. I keep my throat lubricated here. Um, if you look at a particular gauge on any given day of the year, if you have a long enough flow record, you see a broad range of flows that could occur on that day. And so yes, there's seasonality. But what ecologists have argued is you can't just go in there and focus on a minimum flow, y'all. We need to think about the entire range of the natural flow regime if we're actually going to protect species. And we have to think about that because every part of it's important. We have these high flows that are habitat forming. We have intermediate flows, especially running up to spawning period when Fish are moving around and migrating, um, seed dispersal, scouring the sediment out of the stream bed so that they're good spawning areas. Um, and then during a portion of the year, the summer, spring and summer, when fish are reproducing, they are growing, they're small, they're growing up to a size that they overwinter. And it's that natural dynamic of flow that we need to protect. And that's great. And it makes a lot of sense. Um, but it's, <coughs> excuse me, it's tough to use that notion to like develop a state standard. How do you always protect everything? We're not going to do anything. We can't do that because we have to use water. We're using water. We're changing the flow in streams. So we come to this question: Can we do we actually know enough now to make a specific prediction about how? If you change the flow in this way, this is what's going to happen to this population of, say, amber darters that's endangered and that we care about. Can we make a real prediction? And I would argue, <coughs> and a number of us have, that despite several decades of research, we lack enough mechanistic understanding about how actual day-to-day -day change in a flow regime affects demographics of a fish population to very often make a good prediction. And in fact, this past spring, um, Seth Winger, who's a, a faculty over at the Odom School, and Keith Gitto, Brandon, you probably know Keith. He's out at, <clears throat> excuse me, out at Kansas. Annika Walters with USGS. We pulled together a group of um, mostly aquatic ecologists uh, in a working group to say, let's uh, Let's think harder about this problem and developing some mechanistic basis for linking stream flows and fishes. And our approach here is to um, say, let's just use a lot of data. 
we're not using a lot of data, but we're using all the data sets that we can put our hands on at the time. And every one of these, um, you can see where our geographic biases are. This is where we, we've pulled folks from. Our long term, <clears throat> mostly 15 or 20 years or more, samples of fishes at particular places. So we can look at those dynamics from year to year in relation to flow from year to year. And by compiling a bunch of data sets, we hope to test some specific hypotheses about, for example, the effects of low flow on fish populations. And that's what I really want to talk about. Um, when we were out there this uh, in, I guess it, uh, August was the last time I was there, a group of us, one of our uh, august PIs said, well, there's one thing we can all agree on. It's that really low flows are just bad for fish. I said, yeah, I suppose we can agree on that. I guess this is a little stream down in southwest Georgia. Luke and I were just talking about these streams. Completely dries up. It hasn't always. That's a U.S. stream, yeah, stream gauge. But now with a lot of irrigation, that stream is completely drying up. Presumably, it's pretty bad for fishes. But it turns out that low flow effects on fishes can be pretty hard to predict after you move up out of those small streams. This is a, this is a graph of showing change or projected change in the number of fishes in a stream as that stream gets lower and lower. The 10-day running average discharge, this would be the median for all time as it gets lower and lower. And this is Jeremy McCargo and Jim Peterson, and they did a bunch of sampling down in the lower flint. Very nice work. And they show that in small streams, whether the channel's confined or whether it's really wide open with broadly connected to the floodplain, as flows get lower, you lose species. And that's true in medium size, too. But you get up into large streams, it can be very hard to see an effect. And they've got a I'm not going to show it to you, but they've got an identical graph that is not richness but abundance. That in the large rivers, their largest sites, they just didn't see much of an effect, especially where it was confined. And that makes it hard to turn around and make a prediction when somebody asks you, hey, what's going to happen if we take a bunch more water out of the stream if it's a pretty big stream? And that's, a, that's the problem we're trying to get at, is can we improve our ability to predict? So. Here's an example of where we'd really like to be able to do that. Uh, the upper Flint River system in Georgia is pretty special for us. It's, um, it flows undammed for a long ways before it hits the first pretty small dam. There are no big federal dams on it. It flows down off the Piedmont, um, big rocky shoals. It supports a fairly diverse community of fishes and native mussels. So it's important from a conservation perspective. Um, it's got shoal lilies. It, uh, it's important for recreation, boating and fishing. Shoal bass are there. We love the flint. Uh, the problem is that we also love it as a, a water supply. It heads up. Has anybody ever flown into Atlanta? Well, you landed on the headwaters of the Flint River, literally. It's very tip-top headwaters are out there at runway number five or four. I shouldn't say things like this being recorded and somebody's going to nail me and say, no, three minutes, three. It starts at the Atlanta airport and it flows, flows down out of the metro area and a number of municipalities up there depend on that river. Oh, it's pretty small yet for, for, for their water supply. And in the last 20 years or so, I don't know if you can see the shaded area, we've had a combination of population growth and some pretty severe droughts. And so the, note that this is on a log scale, and this is showing the complete um, flow trace at a gauge that's fairly far downstream. And so the managers are looking at this, and they're worrying about, one, are they going to be able to supply the water they need to supply? Um, Certainly, but they're also beginning to ask about, uh, with some encouragement from American rivers, 
and the Flint River Keeper working with them. What about the ecological consequences? We're, we're worried about having enough water, making sure we have enough water supply, but what's going to happen in the river if it keeps getting real low like this? And this is a picture of one of those big shoals just practically dried out in 2016, which was another pretty severe drought year for us. Now, think about this, and then think about that graph I just showed you from McCargo and Peterson that says, well, if you look at fish species richness in a nice confined channel like this, it really doesn't change. And then you start to get a sense for the problem. We... Um, recruited a student, Laura Rack is at the University of Georgia now, uh, who came in to work with American Rivers and this group of water suppliers to see could we just use what's been published and even begin to get to an answer. So we could say, well, as it gets really low and it stays low for longer, here's what's going to happen to the river. And Laura has developed a conceptual basis for doing that and saying, well, let's look in the shoal habitats, and we'll think about a very simple food web that's driven by uh, probably algae. Um, it's a big, wide-open river. There's a lot of primary production there. We have this plant. I'm going to talk about it a little bit more, river weed, outforming habitat, aquatic insects, and then we've got some fishes in there. And so as Laura is starting to parameterize a little model that could help, and it's going to have all kinds of uncertainty, she's relying a lot on the, um, on the work that we've done in other places and that I'm going, to, I'm going to show you some of now. And it begins, fortunately, it begins close to home. I think possibly the first earliest um, study of productivity, riverine productivity, might have been this paper. Uh, Dan Nelson and Don Scott did it. They were at the University of Georgia. They were doing this work in the 50s in the middle of Coney River. And um, this was before uh, the, our more modern methods, say, for estimating secondary productivity of insects and streams. It's really an interesting piece of work. And it lays a basis for uh, of historical knowledge from a river that I can get to in about 15 minutes from my office. And so we started to really look at this. And it's also Athens water supply stream. In fact, um, they did that work in the 50s. And then Jack Grubaugh and Bruce Wallace um, came back in the 90s and redid it to have a historical comparison. So we've got a nice baseline and using more modern methods for estimating pro production. So we've got a baseline for this river. And the community that these guys described to us is one of uh, where those rocks are heavily colonized by this plant, Podostomum stratifolium. Does anybody know this besides Brandon? Do you ever go out and wade around in uh, Piedmont rivers? And it's a green stuff, you know, that's mossy, and you're kicking your chacos in it? It's probably Podostomum. Um, this plant was, used to be, pretty widespread in Piedmont and Upland rivers across the eastern North America. It's, I think it's the only North American representative of a pretty large family of aquatic plants that are mostly tropical. It grows in the fastest water you can find it. Um, and it does form this almost carpet of moss-like vegetation. But it's, it's not a moss. It's an angiosperm. It has a tiny little flower, a tiny little seed. And it's got some interesting growth habits. I, I call this the straight form. And then sometimes you see it, and the, these leaves are all curled up like a fist. I call it curly kale. I'll show you a picture of that in just a second. It holds onto rocks. It's got a hold fast. It sticks to rocks with. And sometimes you pick it up, and it, you just pick up a whole bunch of gravel that's just all cemented together. This podostomum forms fabulous habitat. And there have been a handful of studies now that have done things like go in and cut off the podostomum and measure uh, the change in aquatic insect biomass. It's super good habitat for bugs. And it's also pretty good habitat for fishes. A lot of fishes hang out around it. They hang under it. Brandon was reminding me I had a, a student years ago, Jane Argentina, and we actually moved podostomum around and created patches with riverweed, patches without riverweed, and looked at how fishes reacted to that and showed, yeah, you know, they really have an affinity for this stuff. And they should, because it's a grocery store. 
It's full of bugs. So this is an important part of the community. And, and I'll say it, when Nelson and Scott did their work back in the 50s, they surmised that river weed entered the food web primarily as detritus. So they were looking at the system as very heterotrophic, and this stuff would die and, and then be broken down by the bugs. Both studies also pointed to looking at the invertebrate community as being dominated by filter feeding insects, um, and especially filter feeding caddisflies. Some of you guys fish, right? And so you know what a caddisfly is. Um, for those of you who don't, it's a, these are the little moths that come to your lights all through the summer, at least they used to, and they look for all the world like a little moth, except they got really long antennae. So you watch for those. But they spend the first portions of their lives as larvae, the, the adults mate, they go back, they lay eggs in the water, and then they hatch out into these little larvae, and they go through five instars. And there are a lot of kinds of caddisflies, and a lot of them build elaborate cases. Does anybody have caddisfly jewelry on today? Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Good. But these are just the net spinners, so they don't build a case, but they do spin silk, as they all do, and they spin a web, and they're filtering food items out of the current. So again, they're very dependent on water flow. And both the early study and then the more modern one showed that if you look at secondary production across that benthos, it's dominated by filter feeders out there in the shoals. So you got all this rock, the rock's covered with riverweed, and you got um, caddisflies. Neither study looked at fishes, but I've looked at fishes because I think they're great. And we've, if you go out and sample them, these are about 15 species that are common in the shoals. And it's a handful of uh, species of minnows and some suckers and catfishes, including a little mad tom catfish that's adorable. We have a native red-eyed bass um, and, and two darter species that you can commonly find there in the river. Now, so the Oconee is an interesting place, but it's also interesting, much like the Flint, in that in recent years, we started to see some really low flows. Again, this is on a log scale, and I'm just plotting here the lowest flow that was recorded in each year in the history of that gauge. And I've circled 2007 when the lowest flow was 3.5 CFS. And the channel I've been showing you pictures of is 100 meters wide. And, and so you might also note that, um, well, you see, we had a drought in the 50s. We had a drought in the 80s, and then around 2000. And then since then, we've had a number of fairly low flow years. During that crazy low flow period, the, the stream was certainly more rock than water. It was, uh, uh, yeah, it was startling. And, between about 2000 and when this drought hit, Athens had installed new pumps to take their withdrawal level from about, it was around 13 million gallons a day to a potential of 60 million gallons a day because we were pumping to an off-stream reservoir. We dammed a bull stream, so we had some storage. But in this particular drought, we had drawn the, excuse me, we had drawn the reservoir down uh, the drought didn't end. Uh, the mayor said, we're running out of water. We're going to run out of water on December the 24th. Quit using water. Shower. Take showers with your neighbor. Do whatever you need to do. It was serious. And they went to the um, state EPD, who gave them a waiver from any of their in-stream flow requirements, and said, pump. Do what you need to do. So we were pumping the river down pretty low. And... Wow, what a great opportunity to look at ecological consequences of very low flow. So, so we commenced to do that. I recruited two graduate students at the University of Georgia, Jennifer Paul and Rachel Katz. And uh, you can kind of get a sense here that this is where the, the river is 100 meters wide. And the flow at that time was, I mean, it was flowing, but there were channels down through there. And I said, let's look at the river weed and the caddisflies, because I know how to identify those. That's good. And they're major components of this food web. So, so that's what they proceeded to do. And it shouldn't come to, now, now I need to say this. We only were sampling where there was water. You know, 
clearly the stream itself has shrunk. But we're looking at where the water's still flowing. Okay. Well, so Jenny, Paul, they were sampling uh, monthly and in parts of the year biweekly, as I recall. Jenny was collecting all the river weed and taking it back and drying it and measuring the biomass. And the biomass here is shown in the black bars compared to the earlier 90s studies in the gray bar. The biomass was extremely reduced. And again, this is not counting just the dried out rocks. This is on a per square meter of flowing water basis. Um, and when she related biomass to other covariates, it was water velocity was really the best predictor of where you were going to get the most, the most pedosmum. So yeah, so during the drought river, river weed really took a hit. And I'm going to divert now just a little bit to some more recent research because at the time, I, uh, I probably looked at this just a little simplistically and I said, yeah, yeah, well, you know, the stream's drying up. And sometimes internalist pumps and the pumps really pull the water down and the stuff probably gets exposed and then it probably desiccates a little bit and then the water comes back up and then it breaks off and that's the story we were telling. More recently, I've kind of had my eyes opened a little bit to a little bit different story. James Wood and Caitlin Kahn, James just finished his doctorate a year ago or so at Georgia. Caitlin is a student there now studying stream metabolism. They're also really interested in primary production in relation to flow. And the graph is showing data that Caitlin collected during the 2016 low flow period, two months there, where this is just the biomass of pedostomum per sample plotted against water velocity where she took that sample, showing that there's maybe not a linear relationship, but below a certain velocity of around 40 centimeters per second, especially in the second later month, we just didn't get much pedostomum. And James said, I think stuff's eating it. And that, that's not of the paradigm. The paradigm was that it enters the food web as the trial material. And then he proceeded to demonstrate that to me. He went out, and uh, I like doing mercury capture, and so I'm going to show you some mercury capture data. He said, I'll do mercury capture on rocks. That's all right. Great. So here are some tagged rocks. So he went out, and, he f and this is that curly kale form of pedostomum. This is a mystery uh, yet to be solved. So he used zip ties, this is a big plastic user, zip ties, and this is just an example of two rocks that are individually marked. He took them, found rocks that had good pedostomum, and about half of them he took and he put them in where the velocity was greater than 40 centimeters per second. And then he came back 24 hours later. And the rock on the top is representative of the ones that he moved in high velocity, and the rock on the bottom he moved into little pockets of low velocity. And I was stunned. In 24 hours, it was gone. Um, he left them out there for almost 70 days, and those differences between the stuff on the high and the low velocity persisted. But he took some of the low velocity rocks and he moved them back into high velocity after a couple of weeks. And that's what that third column is, and it's just showing Regrowth. They just started regrowing when he moved it back in the high velocity. So there's clearly some resilience. And that's what Jenny Paul had found too. Was that once flow came back up, the stuff regrows. So we think it was getting consumed down by who? That's probably one of the most frustrating things, uh, parts about this work is I don't think he ever saw a consumer. But we've seen, we know a deer eat it. I've seen turtles eat it. I've watched beaver eat it. Um, and they sent me a video, they did send me one video after he finished this work of geese out in the middle of Coney River in areas that would have been flowing very swiftly, just hanging out eating pedostomum. So um, James has suggested that river weed really takes advantage and finds a refuge from its consumers in high velocity areas and that one of the consequences of low flow periods is that those consumers can get in on it, whether it's geese coming from the outside or turtles from the inside. And so we're not really sure who's doing all of that. But if that, it, it may be a consumption effect. Okay, so um, back to 2008, at the same time that Jenny was measuring, but awesome, Rachel Katz was uh, 
collecting and doing the pretty hard work of measuring production of, of hydrocycids. And the early study, 1991 versus 2007, 2008, are shown over here, where our, the drought, or I have the arrows above, she saw like almost 88% reduction in production, secondary production, grams elaborated per square meter of stream. And again, it's just where things were flowing of these hydrocycid caddisflies. The smaller species in this uh, just smaller body, Kamiatopsyche, showed about a 40% drop. So I'll come back to this. Um, but overall, we were seeing riverweed go away, caddisfly production dropping, and Rachel uh, was a pretty good sport about this because she had signed on to study fish in the lab and I had her on cattle slides and she kept saying, well, what, what do you think's happening with the fishes? And uh, we talked about it and I was pretty intimidated by a hundred meter wide river. How would I quantitatively study fishes in that? Didn't really know. But, but we came up with a plan and we decided to focus on an animal that I knew uh, had been very abundant in the shoals. Who said this is one, who said this is one of their favorite fishes? It's the turquoise darter. Um, it's, uh, we, had, we had collected it before. I knew it was abundant. And I also knew from previous studies that darters are pretty easy to mark. Um, and this is showing one with these little uh, visual implant elastomer marks. This one has three marks. So they, they tolerate this really well. I said, all right, let's try it. Let's try mark recapture, but let's just move downstream just a little bit where the river becomes a little more confined. Um, and there's a shoal that's about 50 meters long, and we can sample the thing and see if we can catch any fish uh, and mark them, and we'll measure survival. And so this is the shoal we went down to. And that's looking at most of, the, most of it. So that big shoal is just upstream around the bend. And this is during, uh, of course, during the very low flow period. And so I thought, if the cover's going away with pedostoma, maybe in the guts of geese or turtles. Hydrocycids, uh, the secondary production has gone very low. I anticipate that fish survival would be low. I said, we'll just see if we can catch any. Let's just go and see if we can catch any. Oh, uh, excuse me. Um, and of course, the show looks better when flows come back up. So that, you know, there it is it, with more water in it. I hope nobody actually watches this. So <laughs> it'll gross them out. Um, so we started a study, and we kept it going for five years because it was that interesting. We started in 2008, and we kept it going through 2012. And the idea was we would do three-day mark recapture, and we go out and we do that at 30-day intervals starting kind of midsummer in through the fall, so that low flow kind of summer period. And um, we'll use that month to month to mark recapture to estimate darter survival. And then we can relate that to what the flows are between those samples. Um, and so what I'm showing up here is discharge. Again, it's on a log scale. We started in 2008, it was getting very low, and the little dots are the dates that we went out and sampled. Okay. 2009 was, uh, it was low, not as low, and then after our second sample, we had a rain event that was unbelievable. It flooded Six Flags over Georgia and Atlanta. It washed bridges away. I mean, so our season was done. But then 2010, we had kind of a normal flow year. We went out four times. 2011 was another very dry year, and 2012 was pretty dry, too. How many fish do you think we marked? Closest without going over. So we marked to release 7,887 individual turquoise stars. That's how much fun this project was. I thought that we wouldn't find any because the stream had been so low. And I thought that we would be able to use this combination of colors of VIE. Y'all know what that is? You put it in a syringe, yeah. Um, the first day we went out, I devised a whole scheme where we could individually mark as many as 700 fish 
with the combination of colors we had and body position. And the first time we went out, we caught 100 fish, and I said, oh, well, this isn't going to work. We had to use batch marks. So we did. We used a batch mark for each day. So that's not a staged picture. Those are um, three turquoise darters that were obviously marked in differing, probably in differing months, using differing marks. We were able to estimate our capture probability, and it turned out that if we sampled for about an hour out there in that shoal, we did it the same way every time, an individual had about a 13% probability of being caught, and that was very consistent, which is very helpful. As I'll show you in a second, we estimate monthly survival. It was about 0.76 for juveniles and about 0.84 for adults over that August to November period, but really variable. It varied a lot. And when I say survival, I'm talking a parent's survival. See, wild livers know what that means. It means that the animal survived and it stayed in the site. If they leave, it looks like mortality, and I can't do anything about that, right? So it's a parent's survival. So we got some good data. What we did not get was any real strong evidence that survival varied in relation to flow. The curves on the top are for the young of year, which were animals that by late fall are less than about 45 millimeters. And on the bottom are adults, which are up 45 up to about 70 millimeters. The only one of these relationships, and these are tiny, so I'm going to tell you what they are. It's the median discharge over the month. Adults didn't care. The minimum discharge, adults didn't care. Young of year, apparent survival went down as minimum flow came up. Yes. Percent of time below the 7Q10, which is a low flow statistic, it, it didn't matter. The last one, there's a maximum discharge. And this is low flow variability. It's the only thing that, that we saw anything with. And low flow variability means that when the flow is really low, if we got some little bit of rainfall and it pushed it around, so there's higher variation, young of year showed higher survival, and the adults showed the opposite. Not obviously depressed by low flows. So that was a little bit of a surprise, but before we even got to that result, the other one that, um, well, th uh, let me say this one. This did not surprise me. Lots of folks note that rivering fishes can sometimes produce a lot of young of year during a low flow year. Perhaps one of the worst things that can happen to you is a little fish is a big storm, right? So we got highest abundances of um, young of year during our two driest years, and generally the lowest abundances during our wet, or it was really kind of a normal flow year. But here's the thing that really kind of blew me away. And so we looked at adult Again, I didn't think we'd find that many. We found a ton. Um, in that first year, in particular, as we got into the fall and it got drier for longer and longer, adults were moving into our study site. They were just piling in there. We didn't see that in our normal flow year. There were already a bunch in there in 2009 when we started. We saw the same kind of variability in 2011. A bunch of adults came in over a 30-day 30 30 period, and then some of them went back out. And then again in that last year, we saw this big aggregation of fish coming into our shoal. What do you conclude from this stuff? Um, so Rachel and I, we published this, and I've forgotten the title of the paper, but it's something like, oh, wow, some of these fish are really resilient to low flows. And our conclusion was that here's this species, and, and I didn't note this, and I meant to, that everything we know about this fish, the turquoise darters, it really loves fast flow. It's got these great big pectoral fins. It sits down in fast water. Um, the studies of it in streams, and there are a couple of master's theses here from Clemson. I meant to ask about that, but I'll ask later. Uh, have looked at habitat use. You go in a little stream, you find them in the fastest water available. So that they love fast flowing water, and yet here's a fish that it, as we interpreted it, we said, hey, it can be pretty resistant to extreme flow reductions um, by pumping out a lot of young of year during those low flow years and then surviving really well. And w as we noted, part of that, a component of that, apparently, is that they were really aggregating into what we happened to choose as a study site because it was a good place to sample. So we saw strong 
fish aggregation there. Um, I think this is true. Now, if it's true, it's caused me to think about, well, so what are some other consequences of that? I want to go back to those hydropsyche data for just a moment. Because if you're a hydropsyche, that's probably what a turquoise darter looks like. Uh, it's like a tiger, right? Um, what could be their effect of having, oh, it, it, in 2008, we had over 3,000 individual darters in 1,500 square meters. What could be their effect? What do they eat? Isabel Evelyn was an undergraduate at UGA, and she came working in the lab last spring, and she said, I'll look at that. And uh, she looked at 32 individuals that we collected on six dates over four different years, some very different flow conditions. 32 is not very many individuals, but those guts were packed. She measured and identified almost 600 individual prey items out of those guts. And as I was dissecting the animals for to, to look in the guts, I just was struck by how much fat was in them. Even the fish that we collected during those low slow periods, they looked great. And what were they eating? The adults are eating primarily hydropsychic caddisflies, hydropsychic and chromatopsychic. The young of year um, eat small prey overall, but also eating a bunch of hydropsychic as well as, as uh, coronamid, midges, midge larvae. I've done a little poking around in the bioenergetics literature, and I would love to be able to put together a little bioenergetics model for those turquoise starters out there in those conditions and estimate how much of the secondary production was actually going into the gullets of turquoise starters during these droughts. Well, so after 2012, um, we weren't able to do the three day every month, but we kept going at least in the fall. Uh, up till even just a couple weeks ago, we went out and we did our standard sample where we catch the fish and count them and measure them and put them back. And because I have the early years, we're able to, uh, mm, I'm willing to assume that our probability of capture is staying similar. And so put all of these data into a single model to estimate this is just the last sample of the year, late fall, abundance of the turquoise darters in that 1,500 square meters. And so here are those first five years we were doing in depth. And then 2013, 14, I missed 15, 16, 17, 18. And I'll just point out to you that the abundances in that shoal are varying an order of magnitude. The population uh, could be changing a lot. And by incorporating those later years, we have a pretty broad range of flow conditions that we're looking at things at. And let me explain what this is, because I'm going to show you like one more graph with this. This is uh, the summertime median flow divided by the long-term median for that 100-year record out there at that gauge. So one is dead on the long-term median summer flow. And so you see our earlier years, it was really low. But we've had some pretty normal and, and even wettish years <coughs> since then. And sure enough, if I take those abundance estimates and plot them against that flow index, again, one is a normal flow year. Um, we're really seeing higher abundances when summer flows are actually the lowest. And, and that's partly, certainly, a result of uh, higher juvenile recruitment in those low flow years, although not in every low flow year, but in some of them. The Powell Center group that, that I mentioned earlier, we're going to take long, we're taking long-term data and looking at trends, the response variable that we're using there is actually the change in population from year to year. That being uh, an estimate of population growth rate and comparing that to flows. And I, we've only got 12 years of data here. I don't have enough to start fitting regressions to this yet. But just looking at a correlation of that annual change in abundance, again, um, it certainly looks like to me the study site population at least decreases as flows get up to a normal level. Uh, I, yeah. So I, 
I can't escape that. And I showed this to my colleague Seth Weiner a couple of days ago. And he said, well, congratulations, Freeman. You found the one fish that benefits from low flows. It's good. Maybe. Um, but let me show you some of their data. So we're, this is, these are preliminary analyses that Seth is doing here. Also, graduate students Philip Bumpers and Ed Stowe are a big part of this. We're using a much larger data set. And these are long-term data. We call it long-term. It's over 20 years now. Where we go to Shoals and the Etowah River out in the main stem is very big. He, mark recapture is kind of out of the question anyway. We go every year in the fall to count fish. And they've been looking at data for 13 species, 10 different sites. So it's a much bigger data set. It's much better. And asking, is there evidence that the change in populations in any of the species from one year to the next varies with the flow conditions? Right. And their low flow metric that they're using is a little different. It's the number of days preceding our sample during that growing season summer that are lower than a threshold. And I've forgotten what it is. It might be like a 10 percentile flow or something. So it's how low and long have things been? Well, let me show you what they get. And again, this is preliminary, and, and we're, still, we're still mussing with this and trying to understand it. But if you look at your growth rate from the previous year, and this is showing for those 13 different species, in relation to how low, how long, how many low flow days you had during this summer, for about, I don't know, a third of the species, there's fairly convincing evidence that the population actually goes up. Um, this one, Kusamatom, is one of our species of, of conservation concern. The black banded darter up there at the top, a, a more widespread species, actually shows an, a negative effect. So it's kind of across the board. Now, just think about if these little fishes are doing what turquoise darters do when the flow gets low and swimming into the shoals, how that is really going to mess up your ability to look at actual population change from year to year. So if they did that, what would you expect to happen in the next year when the flows come back up? Yeah, you expect them to leave, right? They're going to spread back out. And in fact, in Seth's analysis, if you look at those flow effects with a one-year lag, you see a negative. And if you just add them together, example, uh, my example here, this little Kusamaton, you get a positive effect of low flows one year. By the next year, the populations had dropped back down. You add them together, it's a net effect of zero. And that's true for all of those species I have outlined in blue there. Only three species show much evidence of a consistent negative effect of low flows. Extreme, we call them extreme, yeah. low flows on those populations. Well. What does it mean? I don't know what it means, but it's caused me to think about the problem a little bit differently. When we first approached the Oconee River, and it looks like this, and as I now approach the Flint River as it looked in 2016, all dried up, I, uh, I might have said the consequences of these, let's say, unusually low river flows desiccation, we're drying out, we're drying out the vegetation, there's going to be declining productivity, fishes are going to take it, we're going to have lower fish survival, the whole system's just going to kind of crumble down, and hopefully it'll be able to come, come back when the flows come back up. Um, maybe, and that could be true, um, but now I look at it a little more nuanced. At least some of that diversity out there in small body fishes may actually be um, concentrating in shoal habitats. And generally, the effects of very low flow conditions might be to redistribute fishes. I really hope nobody watches this. Because it might be that the effects of those very low flows redistributes fishes much as it redistributes the geese population in Athens, Georgia, which all flocks into the river to eat the podostoma when the flows are low. And then they go feed up in the fields when the flows are high. It could result, from a shoal perspective, on elevated predation on those shoal insects. 
something does, something's driving it down. And now I'm starting to see, hey, consumption, top-down consumption might be a large part of the changes we see out there. And there are consequences of that. If you're a bird or a bat, depending on emerging caddis flies, well, that resource may be actually choked off during these low flow periods. Riverweed may not be drying up so much as being consumed, um, which we know has uh, reduces insect habitat. I didn't talk about them, but we also see algal blooms during these low flow conditions. And part of that is just a reduction in the scouring flows that allow clodophora and, and algal like that to build up. What are the effects on stream metabolism and the ability of those river reaches to take up nutrients and hold them, retain them? And that's something Caitlin's working at as well. This has, uh, so whether, to the extent that I'm right about this stuff, doesn't matter. Some of those data are pretty good. And, and I think one thing they point to is the relevance of minimum flows, nonetheless. Um, if fish are concentrating refuge habitats, then a good management strategy might be to make sure that, to the extent we can, those refuge habitats persist in, in rivers. But instead of keying on those on the optimal habitat for a whole bunch of species, and that's a spaghetti problem anyway, maybe it will be more productive to key on enough water to allow the processes that allow those fishes to redistribute. Um, if I had, it, something else I would love to know is as the water comes up, do the bullheads just flood into that shoal and chow down on darters? I don't know, right? Could be. So it's a twisted tale for Halloween. Um, th thank you for listening. I would love your thoughts and questions. Two minutes for questions. Yes, sir. So how did your detection probability vary with the different flow rates? We, um, yeah, so when we had the robust design every three days, every month for five years, that detection probability varied from about 0.11 to about point. One five or so, but it was unrelated to turbidity. It was unrelated to discharge at the time we were out sampling. It, um, I really felt very good. I feel very good, and, and maybe I shouldn't, but I feel very good about um, using that to continue to estimate population sizes now from a one day count. Um, it, I didn't say it in two years following all that marking. We just did a two day event where we fin clipped and came back the next day. And when I fit all of those with my additional years of data that just have counts on one day, and of course those aren't contributing, my estimated detection probability is 0 0.12 plus or minus 0 0.004, which seems like unmerited precision, right? <laughs> but, um, you know, so we just, we didn't see a lot of variation in it. Which surprised me. Certainly, if you, if you did and you had some covariates to go along with that, that would be sweet because you could still use the covariates for the days you sample. To, but at this point, for this site, I don't, I don't see a need to. It's a good question. Did you see any other species that moved into these yeah. refuge right. habitats? Um, no. We, uh, in our sampling, we routinely catch uh, that little mad tom and occasionally black banded darters and three or four species of minnows are often common. And we tried, we marked everything that was benthic. And we didn't get enough recaptures to do anything with it. I mean, this is a numbers game. Even, even if your probability capture is very constant, if it's 10 or 15 percent, you've got to get a lot of recaptures to estimate anything, right? Especially survival. And we didn't get enough recaptures on the bullheads or, or mad toms to do anything with those. But it, there was nothing obvious to me. And I wish, and I didn't even count everything. We just recorded it. And I'm kind of kicking myself about that now. I'd like to know. But, but we also didn't see you know, species richness fall out either as all those darters came in. It's just kind of pretty steady.
Yes, sir. Male and female difference? Oh. Uh, I didn't, I don't know. I, uh, as that daughter gets large enough, you, I feel confident to go, that's male, that's female. And when they're little, I do not. So our data are very mixed in recording sex, and we haven't tried to even split that out to analyze it that way. I, I mean, would you expect a difference? No, I, and you know, and so, and yeah, it's a great question, but it wasn't one of our questions at the beginning. And there would be some guesswork on small darters for me, anyway. I, I mean, others are probably better at it, but the males, as they get larger, they get more colorful, and they develop these lines down the side. But when they're smaller, and we go, ah, what do you think? Ah, yeah, no. Ah. All right. Yes. And uh, I guess it's a good opportunity, I guess, to speculate away or pontificate as you might be interested. I love doing that. Uh, I guess with that original graphic you showed of flows, minimum flows, or the lowest yearly flow yeah, yep. for a long period of time, yep. it seems like there's definitely kind of a downward trend. Yep. I just can't help but think that if these fish are, you know, have such a short generation time, do you think that they would be evolving like some compensatory life history? somehow deal with that, or I don't know, trading off the company uh, for something to deal with that? I don't know. That's a great question. That's a great question. I don't know. It would be a little, uh, this is really getting, I mean, I've showed you all my skills. I can catch <laughs> fish. I can mark a fish. Well, we've just been talking about like this. I can identify the last them. But yeah, yeah but, it's been on my mind. you know, to think about, so I think, what, turquoise darters like the Savannah, Altamaha system, and that may be about it. They don't have a very big range, South Carolina and Georgia, and they're little streams to rivers. Um, it seems like th there's some, if, if, yeah, it seems like there's some fertile ground there for looking at local adaptation. It's an interesting question. I thought you were going to ask me, as flows get lower, are we not just filling up the world with turquoise darters? And I'm not sure that's not true. You know, if I had done, if we'd tried to do mark recapture back, say, in the 60s, would I have found 3,000 fish in a 1,500 square meter? Maybe not. Maybe they're really booming right now. There's so much we don't know. Yeah. And yet we're trying to make management and, and need to make, you know, management recommendations. Well, if nobody else has Thanks, any questions, let's uh, thank you. Headed back to Athens just now, uh, so we don't have any like social dinner and things planned after this. If anybody, uh, you know, has any questions or anything, uh, you know, I, now might be a good time to play our club. Yeah, I'm sorry. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>